Hi, I'm Dr. Marge Charmley. I'm a licensed psychologist and the chair of the Marriage Equality Task Force of the Minnesota Psychological Association. I'm also the producer and co-host of By Cities, a cable television program that serves to educate people about the gay, lesbian, bi, and transgender community and our friends and allies. Hello, I'm Dr. Anita Kozan. I'm a licensed speech and language pathologist, both in healthcare and in education. One of my specialties is working with the voice and speech needs of people who are transgender, both men and women. I also have worked as an advisor to gay straight alliances in the St. Paul Public Schools. Along with Dr. Charmley, I am the co-host and co-producer of Bi Cities. In November of 2012, Minnesotans will be asked to vote on a constitutional amendment that would define and limit marriage as being between one man and one woman. This would prohibit same-sex couples from marrying. In the, if this constitutional amendment passes, it would make it extremely difficult to overturn this discriminatory legislation. The Minnesota Psychological Association has passed resolutions which oppose the marriage amendment and support marriage equality for all citizens. As part of those resolutions, the Minnesota Psychological Association is committed to educating Minnesotans about the psychological harm created by anti-gay initiatives and to help the lesbian, gay, bi, and transgender communities and their allies develop resilience in the face of the anti-gay marriage campaign. We at Bi Cities are pleased to collaborate with the Minnesota Psychological Association in this educational endeavor. Psychological research has indicated that people can develop resilience by contributing to and connecting with the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community. In this segment, the second part of our Marriage Equality series, we will share the stories of several gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender people who overcame challenges and obstacles during the course of their lives and have gone on to contribute to and connect with the GLBT community. We hope that their stories will help you to tap into your own resilience and offer you hope and inspiration as we move through this important time in our history. Psychological research has also informed us of the vital role of allies in affirming and supporting us as we face anti-gay initiatives. We will introduce you to several allies who tell their stories of how they came to support us and oppose the anti-gay marriage amendment. Jessalyn Frank is a member of the GLBT community in the Twin Cities who is also deaf. She uses an interpreter whenever she speaks with a person who does not know sign language. Jessalyn overcame challenges of being a member of two marginalized communities to become the Director of Human Services for the state of Minnesota. She speaks to you from that perspective to let you know that you are not alone in facing adversity. Her message is being voiced by Quincy Craft, her interpreter for this segment. There may be people who are viewing our show tonight and learning about some of these services for the first time. And I, I know that we have less than 10 minutes left, so I'd like to give you some time to speak to the audience and, and say whatever is on your mind that you think would be most helpful for them as they're dealing with coming out or as they're dealing with uh, domestic issues, whatever, however you want to reach them. We have five minutes left, so we'd like to give most of that to you. Sure, absolutely. I think it's important to remember that you're never alone. I always thought when I was at Gallaudet University that I could never find a successful job if I was a lesbian. And as I went through things, I found role models. And you need to know that you have role models and you have services, you have to look for things. Once I arrived in Minnesota, I was impressed with 
the different role models who are LGBTQ within our community. And I remember meeting numerous people and they had successful careers. They were director of PEPNET. They were directors of you know, social work agencies. They were doctors and lawyers. And I realized I can be successful. I can have a successful career. And so I started to become authentic in who I am. I'm a state director. As that, I'm a role model in my position. And as a deaf person, my community is so small. And especially as an LGBT deaf woman, my community is even smaller. And in that position, I realized I have to be a role model for everyone, whether they're deaf, deaf blind, hard of hearing, LGBTQ, however they identify. That became my personal goal. So in my position, I make sure that I'm providing access for all of deaf and hard of hearing people. It doesn't matter if you've experienced abuse, been victimized, raped, you're not alone and you can contact us for services. We'd be happy to help you as much as we are able. In addition, my, I realize how important it is for the LGBT community to have their own resources and a safe place to be able to express themselves. Think about the future children. I want them to be able to come out and feel comfortable. I don't want them on the streets. I want them to have role models of who they can be like. It doesn't matter what their identity is and have a place to go. So my own business is really focusing on, on that issue. Also, many people are, have fear in the deaf community. They fear the issues that LGBT people face and so they avoid it, and that never helps. It's important to have education and to share your personal stories. We're all, we're all the same in many ways. We've just been, we were just born different or had different experiences. So I wanna emphasize that you're not alone. We have advocates, we have services and resources available. So please feel free to contact us if needed. Wow, Anita, what an inspirational woman. She's you know? incredible. Yeah, She's she is. Just awesome, really, yeah, really. We had so much fun interviewing her and it's just wonderful to be able to use that segment in this clip in this series right now. It, it, I'm really glad she's a part of this. And also that she has started her own business to help reach out to other people in the deaf and hard of hearing community. Jessalyn, we really salute you. The bisexual community is the least visible segment of the GLBT community. As such, it can be challenging for those of us who are bi to find community and affirmation. Lauren Beach, who is the chair of the Bisexual Organizing Project and the co-chair of the Midwest Conference on Bisexuality, because, talks about what this conference has meant to her and other members of the bi community. 2012 marks the 20th anniversary of this conference, which has been a touchstone for community for bisexual people all over the country and the world. And now I'm here to talk about uh, the conference because it's in its 20th year. So, so yeah. the conference is because mm -hmm. started in 1992. Yes. It's an acronym. It and is. And I know that you've memorized <laughs> the acronym for because. What I, is because? Because stands for Bisexual Empowerment Conference, a Uniting Supportive Experience, or B-E-C-A-U-S-E. -E. Because. <laughs> there you go, because, yeah. Why because? Exactly. So, and this year's theme of the 20 year anniversary is empowerment through community, which I'm also really oh. passionate about um, that theme because I think it ties well into the reason why the conference was founded and also the reason why Bisexual Organizing Project does events all year round um, and not just once a year with the conference, which is of course our flagship event. And right. I, it's a conference that speaks to my heart. That's why I got involved in organizing it is because it was transformative for me and how I saw my identity. And I know that there are many people who have that experience. I think the majority of the people who have gotten involved with the bot board have actually gone to Because First and then developed just an addiction to that feeling of empowerment that they got at yeah, Because yeah. and wanted to help other people find it. It attests to the reality that a lot of people do find themselves and find their voices and find almost, almost a part of their spirit by going to this conference. Mm. And there's nothing else quite like it. Um, and that's why I think that it keeps moving forward. Well, she's our rock star, isn't she? She is. Yeah. She is. Yeah. Yes. I mean, she is just such an incredible young woman who's uh, at the law school at the University of Minnesota and and working on her PhD. Yes, in science. <laughs> so, so she, uh, we're very proud.
that she is part of our community and does so much to reach out to the entire GLBT community. What an inspiration. She is. Gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people of color, as members of more than one marginalized group, face special challenges in coming out and finding a sense of community. Ernest Simpkins survived a religious exorcism of his homosexuality, graduated from Arlington Senior High School and McAllister College, both in St. Paul, and found his way to make a significant contribution to the GLBT black community. Listen to him as he tells his story about resurrecting the Black Pride Festival. Well, what is the history of Black Pride in Minnesota? Oh, sure, sure. Um, started, all started in 1999, and the sort of claim to fame of Twin Cities Black Pride, and actually back then it was Twin Cities Black GLBT Pride back then. But sort of the claim to fame is that it was one of the very first official black prides in the entire nation. That's great. And so we were one of the first um, under the umbrella of the International Federation of Black Prides. And it was the very first official black LGBT celebration in the Twin Cities, Minnesota. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. So started in 1999 and went all the way to about 2006 and the, many of the leaders and supporters sort of felt the need to venture out a new adventure. Um, and so the organization began to evolve and then it sort of began to fold. And during the period of 2006 until about 2009, there wasn't any black pride mm -hmm. and the community was greatly missed. And so back in 2009, my supervisor, Kevin Moore, and a couple of other community organizers in the Twin Cities got together and really began to con the conversation and that dialogue about how can we revamp this and reemerge this organization because it, it's, it's definitely a need and it definitely was the time that it wasn't, the, the, the need definitely was felt yeah. in a big way. And so, Mid-2009 <laughs> was when several people sort of resigned and things and sort of the position of chair, of president, was sort of just thrown into my lap sort of overnight. And oh my God. it was interesting. And I have to just be honest and say that it was, it was probably one of the most stressful things that I have ever taken on. But... One of the things that I really needed to do, I, I called some of my mentors and um, Ernest Hopkins in Washington, D.C., and George Bellinger in New York, and I said, you know what, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do this. And the thing that they told me was sometimes you have to be put in a position to really discover exactly what's inside of you. And they said, don't give up. And so, that's really all the encouragement I really needed. And I began to really think about, this is not about me. This is about the community and the need that there needs to be a space. And so 2009 was sort of that, that first Black Pride back. Mm -hmm. And now 2010, we are raising the bar. We are the revitalization of the entire organization. And we are back with a fierce, and vengeance. So. And a fierce love. <laughs> fierce love fierce for love. our community. That is such a yes. great. <laughs> you know, Ernest Simpkins left Minneapolis St. Paul in December of 2010. He's now in Boston. He runs what's called Boston Glass, which is a GLBTQ drop in center. Oh. He is running a, a, a citywide program. Uh, to work with young men, gay and bi, on um, handling uh, their education for uh, STI prevention. And he is on Brotherhood TV, where he is one of the personalities on the um, black, Latino, and Hispanic uh, uh, TV show. 
So he's, he's just an amazing man. And I don't even think, he, he's like late 20s or something like right. that. He's really extraordinary. Well, I expect we'll hear from him for a long time. <laughs> so just Google his name on, on, uh, on the internet and see what he's up to. Now we would like to, you to meet some of our staunch allies in the effort to defeat the Constitutional Marriage Amendment. Dr. Dan Christensen is the president of the Minnesota Psychological Association. In this interview with Bi Cities, Dr. Christensen talks about how he came to be an ally of our community and what it means to him as president of the Minnesota Psychological Association. As an ally yourself, you know, Marge and I hear and read in the paper how individual people are moved to become audible, become visible, really take a stand on this issue. Was there something that, it, was it simply as, you as president decided this was important or how, as an ally, how were you moved to do this work? Started as a personal, um, I think, more inter I'm a psychologist. It started as an internal experience. <laughs> okay. uh, 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 I, I like to think of my life uh, as being connected to values as best as I can. And um, hearing that this was going to be um, put up for a vote uh, uh, hit me in a way, uh, uh, uncomfortably so. Um, feeling, I think, uh, degrees of uh, frustration, anger, uh, sadness, uh, and I think uh, dismay, I think a whole range of things um, when I thought about it. Uh, and it, for me, if, uh, asking me personally, it, 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 it's on par with, with, with saying, you know, people can have, uh, I'm going to go off uh, uh, for a moment here. Yeah, sure. um, it, it's on par with, you know, when people say, well, what about equal, won't call it marriage, but we'll say, you know, you can have equal rights and we'll call it a, a, a civil union or something. Um, and uh, for me, that's like saying, uh, you know, you can have water, uh, but you need to drink out of this drinking fountain, not this drinking fountain. Um, that you're not equal, you're not the same, and, and who you experience yourself to be is not like everybody else and is not valued in the same way uh, that everybody else is valued, and I can't get behind that. That doesn't sit right with me. Um, and then to know that we've got uh, robust research um, that is utilized in making policy uh, that we can't, in my estimation as president of MPA, it wouldn't be right for us not to um, be moving on this. So it's a personal issue, and uh, happening to be in the role of president of MPA, it becomes an MPA issue. I'm so proud of Dr. Dan Christensen and my professional association. You should be. He, he was so impressive. He yes. is so impressive. Yes. And all the work that he has done this year, especially with uh, Minnesota Psychological Association, um, adopting the resolutions about supporting marriage equality. Yep. Congratulations. And thank, thank you, you, Dan. Nancy Nelson has been a well-known media celebrity in Minnesota since she was in high school. Most recently, she has been a strong and eloquent voice for marriage equality as a radio host on AM 950 Progressive Radio. Here she talks about an important influence her life that led her to become an ally of the GLBT community. She also has a message for our community as we go through the marriage amendment campaign. Given all of that, one would not necessarily predict that you would become such a lovely advocate, and as I said, not only an advocate, a vocal advocate, and a champion of the GLBT community. I mean, the fact that you are embraced by us uh, was seen Thank at the you. National Coming Out Day luncheon. Thank you for that. When you were the MC for that, and um, you know, so thank you for your work. But how did, how did you find your way to that kind of place? I believe it was my mother, and obviously at the time she wasn't talking about anything specific, gay, lesbians, bisexual, black, red. But I was in grade school, and you know, haven't you had those moments that you can look back on and you remember it as if it's a still frame, and it changed my life. 
I was in second grade and I was playing kickball up on the school playground at Minnehaha School. And I was always very athletic and you used to stand and you'd pick teams. And I always got picked pretty early because I was skinny and knobby knees, but I ran like the Dickens. And I played and we came home, I came home, and in those days we all wore dresses. And I had on this little lime green dress with little bric-a-brac right here, and I had on brown corduroy slacks in second grade. And my, I got in the kitchen and my mom said, how was the game? How, you, well, it was nice, who played? Well, Vicki Haas was there, I say to my mother. And uh, she said, well, how did she do? I said, well, she went home crying because nobody would pick her to be on the team. And my mom said, how come? And I said, well, she's really fat and they all call her fatty and nobody would let her be on the team. And my mother got down on her knees and put her hands, and she looked at me and she said, Nan, how would you feel if that was you? And I'm a kid, you know, well, I, and she went, no. How would you feel if that was you? And I told her I'd feel terrible and I'd feel bad. And she said, then you can never, ever make anybody feel a way that you don't want to. And for the rest of my life, I can honestly say that there's been almost nothing in my life that has required a decision about how my actions or my words might affect somebody that I don't hear mom's voice first. It is a privilege to be here. It is a privilege when Marge and, and all of you folks say, I'm with you. I want to be with you. I want all of us to be together. It is a fight you should not have to be fighting, and with everything that's in me, I'm going to see to it that we're all fighting it with you and we get past this nonsense. You are valuable, you are important, you are equal, and you don't deserve what's happening. You just don't. Nancy Nelson, you are amazing. That's just all I can say. She was just a delight to have on, and you know she's she's seen all over the world. I think in commercials and oh yeah, she's, she's an infomercial queen. Infomercial. That's well, right. That's I'll right. I'll tell you, she is our queen she right is here. She's our queen. Thank you, Nancy. Finally, we would like to introduce you to Jeff and Lori Wilford, a Minnesota couple who lost their gay son, Corporal Andrew Wilford, in the war in Afghanistan. Jeff and Lori have become staunch allies of the GLBT community in the wake of their beloved son's death. Here they talk about their journey. We are very, very pleased to have Lori and Jeff Wilford, who are the parents of Corporal Andrew Wilford. And Corporal Andrew Wilford uh, tragically was killed in Afghanistan by an IED last year in February of 2011. Since then, his parents have become very strong advocates for the gay, lesbian, bi, and transgender communities and, in fact, have come out strongly in support of marriage equality. We are very pleased to have them on the show tonight, and we think that you will be pleased to learn about their journey. It's been about a year now, and sadly, you lost Andrew. And out of that, you have been inspired to do some things. And maybe if you could transition a little bit to what you're doing now and how maybe in some ways Andrew has inspired you to do that. Well, it's sort of ironic, I think, that he died about the same time that the legislature was pushing this marriage amendment through. Oh. And at the time of his death, and for the couple of months after that, myself, I was too numb and I just wasn't thinking outside of my, my little self. Um, Jeff was on it though. But um, uh, Jeff and I were invited to be at Outfront Lobby Day, I think it was mid-April of last year, and Jeff gave this beautiful speech. And I stood next to him and I was looking at the crowd and I saw all these faces and I thought, you know, wake up, this matters. This really matters to these people that are here and thousands of others like them. And it mattered to me too and to Jeff. I mean, we have had a loved one that was 
gay and um, uh, we know what it meant. We knew what they were after and thought maybe, maybe we could do something here. And as we were leaving, a woman approached us and she said, you two are exactly what we need. We need straight people like you to stand up for us. <coughs> Um, just like uh, white people marched with uh, black people in the civil rights uh, uh, marches in the mid-60s and oh, it just made so much sense to me and it's not like it's a, a difficult thing to come up with but it, I think straight people have not thought that they had a role in this movement that it was a gay rights issue and you know they might have supported that but didn't feel like they could participate in it or, or should so um, I guess after that is that's when I thought that um, we needed to do something. Um, and Andrew, thinking about Andrew, he would have been really upset by this. And uh, it's very hurtful. It's hurtful to uh, GLBT citizens. It's hurtful to uh, people that love them. And um, maybe we can do something here. What a powerful statement that you looked out at the faces of people at Out Front Lobby Day, and they looked at you, and together this connection was formed to stand with us. And I, you know, I want to piggyback on something you said, Lori, that many straight people, maybe it doesn't occur to them that how important it is for us who are in the GLBT community to have you walk with us, to have you advocate, to have you witness, to help you validate. Um, you know, to mm -hmm. me it's like walking on the side of the angels. Mm -hmm. And we need you, and that you would step up in your moment of deep, deep sorrow to do this is, I, I don't even have a word for it, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I personally take objection to uh, what has been the parlance of the right wing GOP, which is that it's a that there's some kind of gay agenda. There is no gay agenda. There is an equity agenda, uh, which we should all be interested in. But if there's any agenda at all, it's certainly a straight agenda to somehow suppress or oppress a minority. Our son died for the Constitution and for the men and the women on that road with him that day. All members of the military take an oath to defend the Constitution. Andrew did not die for me. He did not die for his mother. He did not die for the two of you. He did not die for our K-12 budget. He didn't die for the national debt ceiling. He died for the Constitution and the men and the women that were on that road with him that day. This other stuff is not on their radar at all. And in as much as he died in defense of that Constitution, when Limmer in the Senate, and then later Gottwald in the House, introduced this marriage amendment, I, I, in honor of my son, I have to stand, because he's not here to stand for it anymore. Minnesota has lost 100 soldiers in these wars. Andrew's just one of them. Andrew, for most of this country, is just another war statistic. He is ours to grieve. But we all must take an interest in this Constitution. If you're straight, stand up for your people. Stand up for your loved ones. If you're straight and you believe in the Constitution of this state, vote no this fall. Oh, Anita, it is so powerful. Every time I see that, well, the whole program was right. just outstanding. But both of them are such extraordinary individuals and powerful speakers. And that they would do this in such a painful time in their lives. And, mm -hmm. you know, that interview was so powerful. I remember looking over at you at one point and just the tears were streaming down your face. So yeah. it was something. That's... So we thank both of you, Lori and Jeff, and all of those people who are working with you in your campaign to better represent the entire community in the Minnesota legislature. This concludes part two of our documentary on resilience for members of the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community. We hope that this program on connecting with our community and finding support from our allies will help you, will help your friends and your families 
as together we undertake the effort to defeat the marriage amendment. We want to thank the Minnesota Psychological Association and our crew at Bi Cities for their support in producing this program on developing resilience in the face of anti-gay initiatives. If you are interested in watching the full interviews of the Bi Cities guests featured in this program, you can do so by going to bicities.org and clicking the link to Blip TV. Thank you for watching, and remember to vote no to the Constitutional Marriage Amendment this November.